Well, thank you everybody for being here again. I would like to introduce the artist Michael Sharon, whose work is featured in this exhibit that you see behind me. Many eyes have seen it already this past week. If you have not seen it, please do yourself a favor and make it into the Pine Street Church Gallery at 1237 Pine Street in Boulder, Colorado to see this fabulous exhibit. You can always email me to set up an appointment or a private tour at waverlymatthews at gmail.com. Well, Michael Sharon studied at Western Michigan where he got his Bachelor's of Fine Art. He chose that school for a very important reason. It was featured in Penthouse Magazine as the number one party school in the nation and that's why you chose it. Yes. Good, good, uh, yeah, good reason there. Made a lot of good decisions early on. Uh -huh. Well, we're going to get to some of those decisions <laughs> actually in a little bit. But while there, he won the Walter Enns Memorial Award that goes to the top art student. So he has some gifts. It's not just hard work. You have uh, artistic gifts. You've been featured in numerous exhibitions, but none more important than the current one, Wilderness Serpents and Saints, an Artist's Odyssey. So that's what we're here to discuss this morning. But I have some questions that my community has sent me. I've also added to those questions, but first let's do some preliminary stuff. Let's introduce you. Why have you chosen to make a full-time living in art when you know how precarious that life is? I've witnessed you over the years, feast and famine. And sometimes it's very difficult to watch you through the famine, <laughs> but you have stuck to it. Uh, why not get a day job or something and support yourself and then do the art in the evening and on the weekends? That's pretty easy to answer. Um, I don't like working. I have a profound allergy to it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but you are a workaholic. I yeah. mean, you, you will start at 6 a.m. painting and not finish till midnight. Yeah, it's not unusual for me to put in a 15 hour day. Um, the thing about working for somebody else uh, or having a day job, to me, aside from the fact that it just didn't interest me, I knew when I was really young that I did not like working on things that didn't interest me. So when I was cutting my neighbor's grass, I had sort of a lawn mowing thing, you know, and I'd go cut people's grass and it was agonizing. I did not like it. My first job was at a... Uh, lawn irrigation uh, company in, outside of Detroit. And we drive all over and fix lawn sprinklers for uh, apartment complexes and homes. And I was calling that place lawn irritation instead of lawn irrigation in short order. Yeah. So I didn't really, I, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to work for other people for some reason. I wasn't sure why, but when I started doing art, my vision was not shared with someone else's vision. You know, lawn irritations vision is to have a lawn sprinkling company and clients and all that. And I just, I did not share that vision. They didn't, they did not share my vision. Uh, so it's sort of, the, it, it's just a reversal. It's like, why wouldn't someone who has a company uh, do art on weekends and, you know, their days off or whatever. It's just, we're not, we don't have the same vision and I'm dedicated to it. I think if you are doing a day job or some other income stream that you have to take your attention off of art and put over there, that you're really not an artist. I know that sounds a little caustic, but I'm sorry, your, your dedication is not entirely in art, all your learning and, and you know, uh, trade skills and persona and all that, you know, you're employing it for someone else and you're not learning anything for yourself. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of artists and most of them have a day job, mm -hmm. supporting job, but I think they all agree with your sentiment is that their energy that they can bring to their art is compromised by their day job. They just can't fully give themselves to their art once they get home. Right. They're mentally distracted, that sort of thing. And so it is, it's very difficult. And it's the big dilemma of an artist. 
but you chose to just dive in completely. Uh, yes, however, I don't even know if, if it's chosen versus sort of commanded, you know? It's, yeah, it's a call. It's, it's ridiculous, you know? Uh, it certainly would be a lot easier for me to go and take, for example, what sales skills I have and go sell MRI equipment or prosthetic devices or computers or cars and, you know, feel secure, but um, it just seems like that's what a lot of people do. And, and to me, a lot of people don't seem particularly fulfilled. Got it. Well, I, I admire your courage, uh, what you've done for 35 years. Yeah, stupidity. Some <laughs> people would say you're stupid, but you've made it. So well, you have? started off, yeah, you have, I think you've oh, made okay. it. You started off in art school making very conceptual work like ecclesiastical wars, which has blue cherubs with guns, firing off guns. Was this a sign of youthful rebellion? What was behind those early images? I really don't think it was a, um, a rebellion uh, specifically. I think that I had sort of had established by that time uh, very hedonistic proclivities and I was rebelling over there. This was more like, this is what I knew. You know, I, I was raised Catholic, uh, strict Catholic, went to parochial school, and I was exposed to all these interesting things, you know, people that could walk on water, people that could change, you know, water into wine, angels, you know, people eating fruit in gardens and being punished. I mean, it was just like this interesting thing that I really didn't understand, and it was just what I knew. I don't remember reading in the Bible about guns, <laughs> about <laughs> angels firing guns. So, so where did the, I guess that violence come in? Is that a modern expression of the violence you saw in your tradition? Um, not so much. I, I, I think I think that may have been some sort of reflection of my internal reconciliation around religiosity and what was truly percolating in me. So in the painting Ecclesiastical Warriors, uh, the cherubs, one is red and very demonic and the other one is blue and angelic. So clearly a, a polarity there. I don't think when I was making those things, I was as overtly aware of what drives me as I am today. So I think it was just a natural expression of um, uh, what I knew, overtly or as an undercurrent. I mean, you know, I, my, my experience in the world was not particularly broad. I was a jock in high school and went to church and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, religion was a huge part of my upbringing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a huge part of this current exhibit here. Yeah. You stopped making art, though, soon after school. So what happened? Um, well, I, um, I got out of school. And, you know, I would, like you had mentioned, I had received the Walter Enns Memorial Academic Achievement Award at the university. It was the very first year they had that endowment. It's kind of a big endowment today. I had a couple of four foundation grants. I, as a, a BFA sculptor, had my own studio. The younger students looked up at me, to me and, you know, I was in Disneyland. And then I got out into the real world and I was a big fat nothing. In school, I was a legend in my own mind immediately already. So, um, I sort of got into a day job situation right off the bat. I could not find a job in, in Colorado. I applied for the, a job at the Fetty Bronze Works in Arvada when I got here. And I, I, my Ford Foundation grants were used in researching casting bronze into ceramic shell and then coring the shell with ethyl silicate so that you didn't have to cast a big piece in sections and then weld them together. You could core it and then pass, cast a big piece. 
So when I went to the foundry and they asked me what I wanted to earn, I think I said like $6 an hour or something. They said, oh, we can't even afford you to do that. I mean, it's like, you're just overqualified. And I tried to get a job teaching at Arapahoe Junior College. And I even tried to get a job as a janitor at the art museum. None of this was working out. So um, I ended up getting a job. I met some people and we just started selling art. And it was pretty much door to door. We did a lot of you know, sales training and routines and practice and, you know, but it was the art. So you were in, you, you had sort of a, maybe a shadow career. You were in the arts, but you weren't creating it. You were selling it. Exactly. Yeah. But I, at this time, I was working at an asphalt construction company. So like the very first day I arrived in uh, Denver and that event arriving into Denver was very much the way I ran my entire life. I was running and here come a hurdle and I jump it. There's nothing ever planned. Very, uh, you know, some people plan every methodical, I mean, I, I just could not run my life that way for some reason. I didn't have the sort of intellectual capability. I was very capricious, you know, reactionary. You don't like structure. Apparently not. <laughs> but anyway, though, you were selling art and you eventually were able to quit the day job in the asphalt business yeah. and and just become an art broker. Right. And you were an art broker for two decades before you started to paint again? Um, probably about 25 years. Yeah. So how did the art brokering business affect your creative life when you started to paint again? I think that the, the two biggest ways that being a broker helped me do what I'm doing now is a really understanding art. You know, it's one thing to be a practitioner and then just jump into being a practitioner and never really having uh, a relationship with art history, uh, sort of uh, more arcane movements in art and kind of really getting to know art. I had a, a professor in college that said, he, don't, he doesn't think any student should then really even pick up a brush until they had studied art history for a decade. So that fit in pretty well. The other thing though is, uh, even though I knew a lot about how to make art, I didn't know anything about selling art. I didn't know about selling, period. So becoming a dealer, broker, advisor, I had to learn how to sell. And so I was able to take that skill set to where I am today. And that's why I'm making the big money today. <laughs> well, well, we'll see. Um, you have made big money in the past. And I have. Also, you know, but been, not on been, been my eating work. dinner out of a can too. Yeah, times. I mean, I've made some good licks here once in a while throughout the years, but it's never really been on my work. It's always been like I've sold a Milton Avery or I've sold a Beerstadt or I've sold a Wayne Tebow. You know, so I kind of do have a day job. However, it uh, it's as difficult as this, you know, but it's related and that's the important thing. You know, when I uh, would talk to artists about why they did something, sometimes they had no idea. And then I would say, well, you know, this kind of is reminiscent of Jasper Johns or Ernest Blumenschein or, you know, Wayne T, whoever. And they wouldn't know these people. And I'm like, how can you be an artist and not know who these people are? You really gave yourself a thorough art history yeah. education by being a broker. Yes. You had to learn everything. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, let's talk about some of the darker parts of your history. You were drinking and drugging for a long while. I'm, I think it goes with the territory. The arts are a wash and booze, I tell people often. But then you became sober. So what role has art played in your recovery? Or has it played a role? Well, it, it's been a huge part. First of all, I got sober before I really dove into being a practitioner. The, I, I started becoming a practitioner again when I realized, gosh, I have a lot of time on my hands. Because once you put the plug in the jug, 
a lot of things shift. A lot of interests shift. A lot of friends shift away. Uh, a lot of your play places go away. And then you're sort of, there's this vacancy that that is, you know, presented. And it's like, okay, what am I going to do here? And I thought, oh, remember when you used to love to make art? Let's do that. So that piece, and then when I started to do that, and it was kind of laborious at first, you know, getting back into that flow. For me now, it's the drug. I mean, I, I can, that's why I can work as long as I do, because I like it. Uh, it it's it feels good. I time travel and, you know, I'll, I'll be working on a painting or something and I'll say, oh, I got to call that guy at two and it's six o'clock. You know, you just, you know, it's just very trippy in its own. Well, way. it's like a meditative very practice. So, well, when you started painting again, you painted landscapes, which makes sense because that's the kind of work you were selling as a broker. Mm -hmm. It's what you were most familiar with. And that's what collectors out here favor landscapes and you've done well selling landscapes so why would you make anything else like this very evocative sort of work well um because at some level landscapes to me are sort of illustrative um, i try to make them where you could dissect them into little individual abstractions and I try to amp things up in it, but it's still a little illustrative and perfunctory. Um, however, with that said, all of my landscape paintings have a very overt undercurrent to them that is more in keeping with this. And that's where I can feel like I haven't uh, sold out you know, there's a spiritual component to the work that you don't see overtly, but it's there. And that has informed these. These are starting to come out of the landscapes. And the older you get, the less you care. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, I had no problem being authentic with the imagery I painted in college. It, it, what I did did not affect me did not affect the way people perceived me. But when I got into painting again, I was thinking, wow, this is a very sort of left brain, conservative community here in Colorado. And, you know, I would like to make a little money selling my work. So how do I be true to myself? Oh, you keep doing that thing you used to do, but then you cover it up and put something beautiful over it that people can latch on to and, aren't challenged to really understand. You call those optical communions, and I guess I interpret that as almost like a visual prayer or meditation. Yeah. But sometimes they could be quite graphic. You know, the martyred saints that are often presented as nude. Uh, one of the questions here, let's go ahead and get to it, referred to specifically those images and said, are you worried about offending religious people when you present saints in such a graphic manner. Now, granted, you paint over them, but sometimes you don't paint over them. Sometimes aspects of those images come out. Yeah, they do. And I, I think in particular over on that piece there where the uh, grotesque and the, the catacomb saints robe is quite graphic and borderline perverted so you, you get to see it very overtly it's not hitting hidden there at all you know i guess i would have a little bit of attention on that i'm offending somebody but you know i don't find it that uh challenging i think it's actually fairly innocuous when you consider some of the artists and what they're expressing um it's decorative it's fluffy so yeah, I really don't have a lot of attention on it. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to put it in people's space. And I don't, I don't know if that answers your question. 
Well, it's something inside of you is stirred up and it's producing this. Let's first talk about the serpents. Most of us have a natural aversion to serpents. Why do you paint serpents? And why do you paint them in the colorful way that you do? Well, um, the reason I'm doing the serpents this way is because I've always found them kind of interesting. I've never found them scary, you know, when I was a kid and I'd go out and try to catch them and study them and look at them. Um, but then I, I started to uh, want to soften them. And I, I, I recently put on Facebook that, you know, to help people understand what I'm trying to do with them. And when I was trying to promote the show on uh, social media, media i talked about how when adam and eve had eaten the fruit in the garden and then god asked them where they are after they've done that god knew where they were i mean he's the all-knowing but it was a it was a compelling for them to seek the indwelling so all of a sudden is the serpent really a uh, horrible, you know, purveyor of evil and darkness, or is it the symbol now, since I'm sorry, we have to, they ate the fruit. Here we are, and we're all on a journey, and we're all exploring and seeking at some level. Uh, all of a sudden, the serpent is the thing that had sort of instigated that for us. I think a lot of people in your community, your program community, are seekers. And had it not been for the serpent, they wouldn't be seeking. You're right. Yeah. So I like to paint it like it's candy and it's pretty and it's not threatening and it's interesting and evocative. And not the way you see it portrayed in art history, especially in the 15th century, where it's, you know, sort of, uh, it, it can be a dog with a long serpent neck or, you know, I mean, it just morphs into all kinds of demonic and, and uncomfortable and scary images in the traditional sort of Christian interpretation. So you're pointing to the enigmatic nature of the symbol. It's right. both evil, but it's also good. It represents wisdom, mm -hmm. it represents uh, Carl Gustav Jung, uh, thought the serpent represented the anima, the feminine energy that has a sort of wisdom that comes from the underworld. And, and it's a kind of wisdom that would benefit us. And so you're exploring all these different aspects of the serpent. Right. And interesting, you're using the word wisdom because the, the title of all of these pieces is Wisdom Halo. Then there's a title associated with the image. Mm -hmm. So they're really, to me, they're not even really about snakes or serpents, they're kind of uh, a metaphor for a halo, something that would uh, be a sign of a seeker or a decent person. Mm -hmm. Some of the strongest images of your paintings are consequences of coming to terms with your religious background. So how far are you on that journey? Have you made peace with it or are you still in process of dealing with some of the more difficult aspects of your upbringing? I, th I think I've, you know, sort of uh, wrestled around in this tar pit long enough. I mean, it's fun now. I mean, I've learned a lot about my uh, religion of origin, uh, and, and you've been a huge part of that, compelling that and, and introducing me to some ideas around Christianity and variations of Christianity and Gnosticism. And, and it, so I'm fine with, I mean, everybody's on a path. I don't agree with a lot of the aspects of um, dogmatic uh, religion, but we're all on the same path seeking the one. And I think as, as long as we're doing that in a quasi healthy way, it's good. And um, my, my images are informed 
I, I kind of look at these things almost like stations of the cross. It would be really cool to do a church with big catacomb saints, you know, the, the 12 stations of the cross on each side of the chapel. Whatever. Well, let's talk about the catacomb saints in particular. Where did those come from? You, instead of painting a saint with its flesh on as if it were living, you paint them as skulls. However, most people who've seen these works say that they don't remind them of death, they remind them of life. So that's a unique, I guess, way of representing them. But, but why the skulls? Why present them that way? Well, um, I learned about the catacomb saints through my interest in the incorruptibles. So Do you want to explain what the incorruptibles are? Yeah, the, uh, the incorruptibles are uh, people that were venerated. They had dedicated their lives to God, to um, uh, causes that were really good. Um, they tended to be, well, they were virgins if they were females. And for some reason, I've been very interested in uh, looking at the uh, female incorruptibles. So these people would dedic devote their, they had devoted lives. I mean, they just devoted their life to God and they did good things for others. And when they died, uh, wherever they were buried, sometimes had weird things happening around their burial sites, like either flowers growing rapidly or certain odors coming out of the ground or healings, like someone went to their gravesite and had a healing of some sort. And some of these places would draw hundreds and hundreds of people and there'd be more healings. So they would um, exhume these bodies and they had not rotted. You know, they could be hundreds of years old. And when they got down to the body, they wanted to basically take that, those remains and put them in a, a, a situation where it, it could be more honorable. And venerated, like a yeah, glass tomb or something. Exactly. Where pilgrims could come and people pay their could respects. see them, yeah. you know, and, and kneel and pray with them or buy them. Uh, and of course, all these people were already uh, saints by the time this was happening. Um, they were beatified. Uh, some of them were canonized. So people would pray about specific conditions and causes to this particular individual. But they were um, not rotted. And so that's where they got the name incorruptible. And I, I just became instantly fascinated by that whole thing. And your, your program attendees may be, if you don't know about it, you need to Google incorruptible saints and enjoy that feast. I mean, can you imagine being a, a little kid? You know, talk about kind of wacky. You're, I thought it was weird enough when I was a kid that we walked into the church and there's some dude nailed up on a tree up in front, you know? And I'm like, whoa, that's yeah, it's usually a graphic depiction. There's blood often yeah. painted onto it. Right. And then you got the stations of the cross where some really not great th things are happening. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine going into a church, for example, and seeing St. Catherine of Bologna, who, by the way, is one of the most horrifying, incorruptible saints you can put your eyes on. That's got to be pretty scary. Anyway. But she's exactly the kind of saint you want to paint. Yes. I, well, St. Catherine is the patron saint of um, artists. Mm -hmm. So I became very obsessed about her. Um, I even actually had our book club read her book that she wrote in like the late 1300s called The Seven Spiritual Weapons. Um, so, I mean, the, the interest goes beyond just the the visual power that these people sort of maintain, uh, learning what their contribution was. How did they become a saint? What did they do? So with her, she wrote this book called The Seven Spiritual Weapons. And it was really, in my interpretation, it was more of a uh, self-help book for women on how to be uh, good 
chase people. And then, of course, in my exploring other incorruptibles, I stumbled upon the catacomb saints, which were people by the hundreds who are specifically unknown and were murdered for their beliefs in Christianity and were just basically called saints. So they would remove these uh, bones, full skeletal remains from the catacombs in Rome and distribute them throughout Europe to churches. And when they would get there, the nuns and the monks would decorate them with gemstones and, and fine linens and then set them up and go see them. Really honor them. Yeah, yeah really honor them. But as a little kid with a hyperactive imagination, you and I can walk in there and go, wow, that's kind of trippy. Uh, but those are gems. This is a skeleton of a human, and they wrapped it. But a kid, you go, I mean, <laughs> to me, that's what the Catholic Church was for me. It's like, oh my God, this is a crazy place. <laughs> but it had a wow factor for a little kid too. Okay. Oh yeah, it was, it was fascinating. I mean, when I went to school, uh, the, the nuns were still, the only thing you could see on a nun when I went to school, and for most of my education were their hands and from their eyebrows down to their chin and they had stuff hanging on them you know like police officers <laughs> ropes and stuff and shoot you with things and hit you <laughs> it was a kind of a trippy place well let's talk about some trippy images let's okay. go back to the the nude women who were bloody and have a skeletal or almost zombie-like heads are you afraid of being uh, labeled a misogynist with such images what's behind those um i'm not afraid of being labeled as such um uh i think there might be a, a component there at some level i mean i i think in just recounting the the way the nuns treated us in school i think immediately i had an aversion to females and, but that's not why I'm portraying those figures like that. The reason I'm portraying those figures like that is because they are my narratives around the incorruptible saints. And I've portrayed them as having beautiful uh, flesh bodies, human bodies, um, but I've used their face to communicate that they're actually dead people. And it's just sort of image making and making powerful images. But when you look at them and you understand that this is a narrative about a catacomb or a, about an incorruptible saint, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, if you look at St. Catherine of Bologna, I mean, she's unfortunately just a horrifying looking image. I mean, it looks like a mummy. And But you're a rare artist. You don't paint them in an idealized way. You paint them as they are right now. And it's quite graphic sometimes. Well, with St. Catherine, uh, I have. But I've also painted a number, um, like I said, the I've only done a couple of male incorruptibles. It's mostly females. And I was always fascinated in studying these people uh, they were always very young, they were all virgins, and they were all uh, brutalized by men, even their fathers and their communities. And so I tried to sort of, like in my painting, Boulder Creek, which is a landscape, underneath that painting is the narrative around St. Agnes, who was a very young uh, girl, really, who lived in uh, Italy around 250 AD. And she was very good looking and the mayor of the town that she lived in wanted to have sex with her. I mean, she constantly rebuffed him, said, no, I have turned my life over to God. And so that person that, that community leader, the mayor, whatever, ordered some of his soldiers to remove her breasts in, in a very horrific manner. 
and then put her in that cell to die because she would not concede to his desires. So she's in the cell. She's uh, basically there to die. She's bleeding to death. And St. Peter comes to her and heals her. And she gets back out. And this guy's like, wait a minute. I thought we killed you. So then they strapped her on a braking wheel and ran her through shards of, I don't know if it's glass or ceramic, you know, sharp shards of something and fire. And that killed her. So her death was very ugly. Her, I'm sure she had it, just unspeakable horror to her physical being, you know, awful. So when I portrayed her, I portrayed her as this beautiful sort of body, but I put the trauma in her face and I have her floating around and there's a big wheel in it, but it's illustrated like a symbol and there's a volcano blowing up in the background and there's a big pair of scissors in the sky dripping blood. I mean, theoretically God ordained this event so the hands kind of coming down. Um, it's all about her sort of life. And she happens to be the patron saint of breast cancer. Um, and she's also the patron saint of volcanoes. So if you're gonna have a volcano happen, gotta Pray reach to out her. to St. Agnes. <laughs> so, so that, you know, it's not even my imagination. I'm, I, I'm just taking a story that is about a person and then doing it um, in my own way, yet on that painting Boulder Creek, the, the reason I painted waters, I want to heal her. I want to put her in cooling waters. She's behind the water. You want her to rest in peace. Yeah. So it's almost the exact opposite of a misogynist depiction. Mm -hmm. It is trying to honor them. So, well, we're going to get to some Q&A from the audience, but... Um, one final question, what would you like us to know about you or your art that we may not have already discussed? Um, that uh, I take it seriously and that I vet it and that um, I, I think I know because of my art brokering career, how to create enduring value in it. And I'm trying to preserve that. And I actually have an inventory and Hopefully my kids will make some money off this damn thing. <laughs> so at least somebody will, right? Yeah. Um, so it's like it's uh, you know I I'm, I try to take a curatorial aspect to my oeuvre, whereas a lot of artists are making art and they're making art and they're making art. They don't kind of know why they're making art. They just make it and they make it and they have no record of it. They have no real intention behind it. Um, I don't think people understand that piece of this thing where you're, you know, you're trying to create something that reflects the values of the culture that um, is not a cop out, you know, like, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I want to open it up to the audience. You can ask me questions. Uh, Michael cannot hear uh, any of your questions. And I, I do want uh, to let everybody know, you will remain anonymous because I know some people have a strong response to this work. And I want to encourage you to still voice your question and then I will relay it to Michael. But I will say this, you have the thickest skin of anybody I know. Yeah. So there's nothing any of you all could say that would offend him in the least. I know that from no, the there's first one. experience. What's that? If you say anything against my mother, I will come through that camera and pull uh, you right, out. Yeah, well, I, I doubt this audience okay. would ever do something like that. But anyway, I want to open it up now to your questions. We'll take a few and then we'll close out. Okay. Good morning, uh, Waverly. Good morning, Marco. It's Marco. Uh, first of all, I would like to... <laughs> uh, well, I guess I just identified you. So this question oh, will no. not be anonymous. <laughs> so, <laughs> Heads up, Marco. Are you violated? I, I, so. I would like to thank um, Michael, first of all, for being so candid and open and sharing with thank us you. his journey as an artist and as a human being. And then my question is, 
it's difficult to put into words in a way how he makes it to go from painting the idyllic landscapes to these more provocative saints, snakes and stuff. Does he have like a switch, you know, like a kind of a mental switch that he pushes, you know, to go from one mindset to the other? How long does it take, for example, to, to pass from producing, I don't know, three or four or five landscapes and then going completely the other side? It's sort of like going from writing poetry to writing fiction or something like but that. Not and, only and, fiction, like uh, uh, almost a horror story in a way, you know? Yeah. Okay. He wants to know how you transition just mentally and creatively to go from a landscape to this highly conceptual work. Is there a switch you, you could just turn? Uh, because it's, they're so different. He wonders if there is some kind of mental process you have to go through to transition so that you can create this stuff rather than an aspen growth. It, it's not overt. It's not like um, I think, okay, I'm going to go from painting the landscape, which by the way already is charged with this stuff. Uh, I need to do three Hail Marys, a set of push-ups, and then um, have a banana. Then I can do catacomb saints. This, it's just sort, sort of all in here. So I can, I'm frequently working on the simultaneously. I, I don't know any artist that's worth their weight in linseed oil that does one piece at a time linear in a linear fashion. So I, I can be working on a landscape as a matter of fact, I was working on the big catacomb saint and the Boulder Creek painting at the same time. They were being created at the same time. It's just, there's no shift required into a different mindset. It reminds me of what Walt Whitman said, I contain multitudes. <laughs> you can't, it's, do I contradict myself? Yes, yeah. because I contain multitudes and you contain multitudes. And so you're able to just shift yep. rather fluidly back and forth. Another question. This time I will try to keep you anonymous. <laughs> Hello, this is Jim. Um, and I don't care if I'm anonymous because I'm a friend of Michael's for a long time. Um, I have bought his landscapes and two things I love about them. I just love, I am from Co Colorado. So I love his paintings of Colorado and I love how he does it with his llamas and stuff. I just really love that. The only reason I'm listening today is because I started seeing this new type of painting with snakes and um, saints and women flying around and bloody and skulls. I had no idea where he was coming from. So I'm listening today because he is a friend and this is really, really interesting to me. So I wanna thank him for that. And I did learn a lot as he spoke. So I don't know how you can make that a question, but that's why I'm listening. Well, I hope the presentation has clarified the process from landscapes to these serpents and these catacomb saints. Basically, it was the person said, thank you very much for your work. And they tuned in wanting to understand where in the world this came from. Mm -hmm. But I, I think people have gotten that question answered. Yeah, I mean, it simply comes, I mean, essentially comes from underneath the uh, landscape paintings. These things exist. They've just been concealed. Now they're revealing. Uh, and of course, what informs the imagery under the landscape paintings, uh, that's right in here. So uh, it's, in my thinking, I think it's important that you have to connect the dots somehow, because a lot of artists are doing work that um, it's fairly cohesive and, and consistent visually throughout their career. Uh, however, I, I think that's a little pot boiler. I, if you look at a lot of artists, they've sort of moved through different types of expressions, but the connective aspects is the, 
the optical communions or the visual prayers that are underneath the more illustrative work. This is there. You just don't see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've known Michael for nine years now, I think, and been on this journey with him. We've read books together, discussed spirituality and philosophy, uh, all sorts of ideas that have informed this kind yeah. of work. And I like to describe your journey as you're a very spiritual person. You, you have found uh, spiritual sustenance through nature. You're an outdoorsman and you love hiking deep into the Zirkel wilderness with your llamas and painting. But you're, the wilderness, at some point, you, uh, your eyes turn from outward to inward and you're exploring what's deeply inside of you as part of that spiritual journey. And what's deeply inside of you are these archetypal images that come from your Catholic upbringing yeah. and other experiences that you've had. And they come out and they've come out sometimes uncensored. Right. And so they are quite provocative sometimes, but, but you don't want to censor them. You want them out and because you're, it's an adventure for you to find out what's right. in there. Well, interestingly, I was already, I, I did the first incorruptible saint underpainting about seven, eight years ago. The catacomb saints, even though I had been exposed to them recently, my original drawings and ideas occurred in the wilderness. Like, I wonder if I could like put those in, in frames of jewels and stuff. And I did drawings of it because, hey, when you're sitting in a tent for three weeks, what else you got to do? Got a lot of time on your hands. <laughs> especially if it's raining or you can't paint or snowing sometimes or snowing. I mean, if you're in the wilderness, a lot, it's interesting. A lot of people ask me, if, you know, well, do you stay in a hotel or like, where? it's like, no, I'm in the wilderness. You know, I'm, I'm miles in the wilderness and I have a camp. Yeah. Michael is old school. He loads up llamas with his paints as well as food and everything else he'll need. And he journeys three days deep into the high country of Colorado. I mean, you're in the middle of nowhere and you're painting terrain that most Coloradans will never see with their, their eyes, except through your work. So right. you're, you're really documenting Mo uh, something rare. Yeah, most Coloradans won't ever see it. And certainly no one's probably painted it from direct observation. So you're there, that's a very, I don't know, to me, that is uh, very spiritual. I've had some unbelievably wild things happen in the wilderness. And I know why a lot of people go out there to root around in their essence. Um, I've, had, I've had things happen in the wilderness that I believe if I shared it with some people, they would just say, you're out of your flipping mind. That's bullshit. <laughs> well, do you want to share one of those episodes? Uh, I don't know who's out there in the audience. I'm not sure at this point. Okay, well, we'll have other opportunities. Are there any other questions or comments? Waverly, this is, uh, this is Mike. Mm -hmm. Hey there. Uh, you know, I, I grew up as a Roman Catholic as well, and I was interested in Michael's um, uh, comments about wishing he could do the Stations of the Cross. Uh, as you look at the work in the gallery, it's pretty convincing that he could do the sorrowful mysteries. But what about the glorious mysteries or the joyful mysteries um, that, that don't seem to be as reflected in this work? Good question. This person would like to know that you, you're definitely adept at painting the sorrowful aspects of the tradition, these saints, what they've been through. But if you wanted to paint the Stations of the Cross, could you also paint the, the joyous aspects of the tradition as well? Would that come as easily to you or? I think so. Um, I, the only way I could really address that is to consider, for example, the landscapes, for example, that landscape there, even the, the plain airs, the, the sunsets, they all have these undercurrents of suffering, uh, introspection, exploration, but on top of them is the joy. Uh, Do you so, need both together? Yeah, I, I think I can, but 
it's interesting, powerful images, it's like news. No one wants to watch the news about a fluffy little puppy running on the grass. They want to have some disgusting thing that they can get like art, uh, beautiful art. I, I think um, does not snag people like disturbing art. Does it grab the attention? Yeah. Right. Good answer. Good answer. Anyone else? Question or comment? Waverly, I'm wondering if the camera can show us some of the artwork on the wall. Yeah, I, well, when we finish, what I'll do is I'll just pick up my camera and just give you a 360, quick 360 of how it looks in the gallery. Can I jump in here? Uh, uh, Waverly worked very hard on putting this uh, together. And um, as you are all aware, I think we're uh, around November 3rd, we started seeing a very significant spike in COVID. We were at about 500 cases a week for quite a while. And then all of a sudden we're up to 6,000. Had a lot of people not show. If you uh, would care to, we'll meet you here um, for a very intimate masked presentation and uh, you're invited. Yeah, yeah, you're, you'll get a private tour yeah. free of charge. And uh, I will be here. Perhaps the artist will be here as well if we have enough notice. You live down in Morrison, so it's yeah. a little trickier for you to get all the way up to Boulder on a spur but, of the moment. You know, I, I could probably on most days with an hour's notice be able to get here. It's not like they're pounding the doors down by an art over there. Right yeah, but now. well, you sold quite a bit of this already. Yeah, and... I, did, I, you know, I'm an addict. Uh, we had an okay night, um, but I want more. So we're making appointments. Yeah. So if you would like to see it, just reach out to me, waverlymatthews at gmail.com, and we'll get you in here and set you up and and you can see all of it. It's really the kind of art you must see in person. Video, photography doesn't do it justice. It really doesn't. And those of you who have seen it, some of you out there, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, some of them literally look like there are flashlights behind them. Yeah. Uh, but you cannot see that in photography. I don't know if our dear friend Jane is in, uh, participating in the program today, but she, Jane saw the show and you just can't see these. Like I've got them on Instagram. Uh, I've shown them to people via text messages and stuff and they just do not translate at all. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, this is Jane Waverly. Jane. Yeah, good well, morning. Way to blow her anonymity. Maybe she was going to ask some sort of. I, I, I can, uh, you know. I don't have a question. I don't have a question, but you two have done a marvelous job of explaining Michael Sharon. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Uh, You're welcome. He's a complicated person. Uh, everyone knows that that knows him. And I think you guys just did an excellent job. I wanted to comment on Mike's comment about showing the joy in the paintings. And I'm fortunate enough to own a couple of Michael's art pieces. And I cannot look at those without feeling a spiritual joy. They just pull me right in and I feel his presence there. I feel like I'm standing outside of that mountain looking in or outside of that uh, opening of, with the trees, the aspen trees in the background. And I'm right there. And it's very spiritual for me. So seeing these skulls or the, the serpents and saints, um, I didn't get that at all at first. I just thought that's Michael being Michael. <laughs> and um, but seeing them in person and seeing so many of them and having them explained is just awesome. They're beautiful. They're so deep. I, you know, I'm, I'm being real simple here because I'm a simple person, but they just blew my mind. And I just want to thank you two for putting this show on. It's, it was just amazing. And I, I uh, just really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome, Jane. Thank you very much. She just complimented you, but she finds joy in the paintings that she owns of yours. She looks at them and finds joy in them. But also she's really impressed with these serpents and saints as well and finds them very beautiful in their own way. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'd like to add one thing too. Go and ahead. This is a
kind of a dichotomy, kind of a spiritual thing. I've known Michael for quite a while. And when he paints darkness, I <clears throat> want to know what it's all about. But as a person, he's full of light. So I think that's really interesting that he sees the darkness. But every time I'm around him, he's full of light. He's really valuable to me. So that's just the point. Thank you very much. Uh, this person has known you a long time as Jim, and he finds a lot of light in you. You have a lot of en positive energy when he's in your presence, and he appreciates that. But we also, all of us have our shadow side, uh, and that needs to be expressed too. If we're going to express our authentic self to the world, as artists do, uh, they, there's something called artistic integrity, and that is painting the truth that you experience that is within you. And sometimes that's not only the light, it's the darkness. Right. And you're, you're putting it all out there. But you're putting it out there in a manner that is, it's provocative, but it's, it's beautiful in its own way, as Jane said. Well, um, you know, it's interesting because we're in some times now where it is difficult for people to be themselves. Uh, you just never know who the heck you're going to rub the wrong way with the most, you know, you know, innocuous statement. I don't, I don't really have to worry about losing my job or anything by what I say or do or paint. So I'm very blessed that way. Um, and I'm, a, I, I'll say it. And I know when things definitely get you're in the wrong territory now. But some of this microaggression and stuff that people have to check and vet as they're moving through their day, it's, it's crippling. It's oppressive. Well, an artist cannot be I a true can't. artist and be politically correct. No. An artist just has to paint the truth as it is and let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so acknowledging and, and projecting that dark side that we all have, and it's actually healthy to have it, it's easy for me. I kind of feel bad for folks who have it and, and have no way of really expressing it. Mm -hmm. so, anyone else? Any final questions? I know we've kept you for quite a while. I appreciate your presence here. Me too. And if you want to talk some more, I'm all for it. <laughs> no, but, but let's wrap it up here. Any other questions or comments? Waverly just wanted to comment, uh, you know, that Kay and I got to be there that night for about three hours helping with the show. And that also allowed us to really roam the entire show like three or four different times and really look at the intricate detail and just how multi-layered the symbolism is. And also I originally saw his art as being so radically the, the two sides of Michael were so radically opposed, but now I see where they're unified in the storytelling. And um, it's, just, it's very fascinating. And uh, I think you've done a great job of explaining the complexity of what makes Michael Sharon. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just admiring the complexity, but the unity, somehow there's a unity in it all, but it also reveals that you are a very multi-layered person and there's a lot going on in there and, and it's expressed in this art. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, I think the reason that it works versus is terribly disjointed is I really believe that if, if a piece of artwork is well ex executed, it's formally grounded and very sound and has integrity that it can hang with just about anything. You know, it, it's like walking into a museum and let's say you have a Richard Diebenkorn, you know, Ocean Park thing. And then across the gallery is a Thomas Moran, two distinctly different expressions, but you never hear in that environment, oh my God, that Thomas Moran does not go with that Richard Diebenkorn. They're evaluated on their own merit and you sort of just move to the next one and that's evaluated on its own merit. And that's what I've tried to do here is make good pieces because good pieces 
can hang together regardless of what they are. They are. I think. Good quality stuff. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you very much for giving the most precious gift that you have, and that is the gift of your time. And really thankful that you're honoring Michael uh, by being here and listening. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, truly. So, Spend as always, uh, go out there and make your life a work of art this week. So thank you very much. Take care, everybody. <laughs>